I want to get into the final episode of this series that we've been in called Canceled. And I believe that today we're going to have an opportunity to really, I think, have an instrumental sermon in the way that we operate as a church, an instrumental sermon in who we are as a church, really. I think it can set the tone um, for who we are as a church. It can remind us for who we are as a church, and hopefully it will remind us about grace. Remember, we've, what we believe about God, our theology, really does matter, and specifically our theology of grace. Um, it's very important to who we are as a church. What we believe about God and what God believes and how he acts in grace is very important to who we are as a church. And that's what this whole series has been about. In week one, we talked about what it looks like to realize that you don't get to decide to cancel people. Like, you don't get to decide to do that. It's not something that we have the authority to do. What we actually have the authority and responsibility to do is to forgive people. And praise God that we get to do that, that we get to say, I forgive you because God forgave me. And so we saw that, that freedom comes from forgiveness. And it's life-changing, really, when you get to forgive someone. It's life-changing when you get to give them the gift of grace. Now, now again, we, I'll remind you, that doesn't mean that you invite them back into your space always. But you've given them a gift, the gift of grace, that I've truly forgiven you. I've truly forgiven you in, in this space. I've forgiven you. And then last weekend, we looked at the joy that can be brought to our hearts and lives when we realize that Jesus is not a dividing line. He doesn't divide us by who, we, who should be canceled and who shouldn't be canceled. But we all, when we have allowed Jesus to save us, on the other side of that is the finish line that Jesus said, it is finished. Y'all say it with me on three. It, what? Well, I didn't count, my bad. I do that sometimes, don't I? I say finish on three and then I don't even count. What's that about? One, two, three. It is finished. It's finished. And we saw the finish line is what we got to come to because of grace. It's not a dividing line of like who, you're canceled, you're not canceled. We don't get to do that. That's not our in our authority box. We don't get to check that off on our resume that we can cancel people. And we saw how that allows us not to have to work for grace all the time, but we get to walk in grace. It's a beautiful thing to be able to walk in grace, to be able to walk on water like Peter was doing last week. And then this weekend, I want to take um, these two elements together in an equation of sorts, and I want to show how it affects who we are as a church, because remember, we've said it before, we don't attend Freedom Church we are Freedom Church. And so we want to know how does this get into the ethos of who we are as a church. And so I want to make sure that we end this series with driving home our theology, what we believe about God, on grace as a church. And I want to do that by going to a series of parables where Jesus really, a parable is a story to go alongside a truth to help to illustrate that truth. And Jesus has this series of parables that he was telling to illustrate the rules of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God has a culture. If you belong to the kingdom of God, it's like belonging to a family. You know, in a family, you have a culture as a family. You, you have certain rules as a family. You have certain standards of a, as a family. And you generally participate when you're a part of that family in the culture of that family. And so in the same way, when you are a citizen of heaven, and you are, if you've allowed Jesus to save you, a citizen of heaven, the kingdom of God, then there's a way. I like to call it the Jesus way. There's a way to do everything. There's several ways to do everything. But there's only one Jesus way to do everything. And he gives the Jesus way to living in the kingdom. And so Jesus illustrates through a few parables in Luke chapter 15 some guiding principles some guiding principles of the kingdom. So it starts like this. Luke chapter 15, if you have your Bibles, it'll be on the screens if you don't. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. It says, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Isn't that cool? Tax collectors, notorious sinners came. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people even eating with them. Can you believe it? Jesus is talking to these people, they said, because these were the people that were supposed to be canceled. Like the religious leaders had canceled them. 
They said, they don't get to eat with you, Jesus. They don't, you don't get to participate in life with them. They've been canceled. Who were they? They were the tax collectors. These were the people that were on the wrong side politi of political and ethical arguments. Have you found that there are some people on the wrong side of political and ethical arguments recently? And you know what culture wants us to do with them? Cancel them. Don't you see it all the time? Oh, they took the wrong stance on that political argument. They're canceled. Oh, they said the wrong thing. They're canceled. These people were on the wrong side of the political arguments. And so what I see is that Jesus is speaking to those, to those. He speaks to those that everyone else was speaking out against. And Jesus decided, I want to speak to them. And I wonder if, if Jesus is teaching us something right there. I wonder if speaking to people rather than speaking out against people might actually be a better way. I wonder if sometimes we, we believe if we'll just speak out against it, that, that what if we just spent time with them? People ask me all the time, what do you feel about this certain sin? What do you feel about this certain lifestyle? What do you feel about this? I know, I know Pastor, that you've said what you believe about this lifestyle. What do, you, what do you think about it? I said, you know what? Here's what I think. Why don't you sit down with someone and have a conversation with them? Why don't you sit down and get to know them? What is Jesus doing? He's eating with them. He's eating with them. He says he's with, with notorious sinners. Jesus is with the worst of the worst. He was eating with them and associating with them. He was a friend to sinners and those who were on the wrong side politically and ethically. Now the crowd is trying to, to cancel him. Do you see that? I mean, like, they canceled the people, and when you hang out with canceled people, they try to cancel you. Got to be careful who you associate with, right, because the crowd cancels by association. And, but the kingdom is different. So Jesus tells a story to these people's hearts. And I think he's telling a story to our hearts sometimes because regardless of how we see it, oftentimes we fall in the story, in the place of where the religious people were. We're we like to put ourselves in the hero of the story sometimes, but we probably would be more like the religious leaders if we were in front of Jesus and didn't know yet what he could do and who he was. And so he wants to teach them, and I think he wants to teach us today as well. And he teaches us the difference between a cancel culture and the kingdom culture. And so the, the parable of the lost sheep comes up first. It's, Jesus says there's a man who has a hundred sheep, but one gets lost. So he leaves the 99 to find the one. We just sang about that. He leaves the 99 to find the one. And it says, and when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. Everybody shout out carry. He didn't cancel. He carried. Jesus could have canceled him, but instead he carries him. The, the story is showing us what Jesus does for us. The good shepherd is Jesus, by the way, in the story. And, and, he, and he cancels him. And I wonder if there's anyone who can remember when you were in need of care. Do you remember back to when you were in need of carrying and need of finding being found, somebody coming out and finding you and not someone just finding fault with you. And see, see, Jesus could have ruined you and he could have ruined me, but he redeemed me. Is there anybody here who can remember that? Because I remember it. I think we just need to take a 15 second praise break and just thank God for who we were. Thank God that he carried me instead of canceling me. God, you could have carried, canceled me, but you carried me. God, you didn't have to care about me, but you cared. You cared enough to carry. You cared enough to come. You cared enough to walk with me. When I walked out on water and I fell, you put your arms around me and you said, this is how we walk. This is how we walk. And you walked with me. Thank God. Thank God. Praise God. He didn't just put us down. <laughs> Praise God. He didn't just find you in your sin and say, hey, you better get back home. You better find your way. I love it when people say that they find Jesus. I love that because I know what they mean. I know what you mean when you say you find Jesus. But here's what I've learned. I didn't find Jesus. He found me. He found me because I was so deep in my sin. I didn't have any way to get home. But he came when I was missing in action. And he came and in action got on the cross. And I am praising God for that, that we see the story of the lost sheep. And I hope that it shows us, that it says when he arrives, here's what the good shepherd does. 
he will call together his friends and neighbors, saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. He says rejoice. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. I've had people over the years question me. They say, hey, I don't really like it that you say we as a church care more about the people who aren't here than we do about the people who are here. And, and I don't mean we care more about them like we love them more. I don't mean we care more about them than we won't be there to meet the needs of the people in this church because we certainly will. And I believe there are people in this church who don't know Jesus yet, and so we care for everybody. But what we mean by that statement is we're going to put an emphasis on the strategy because it says all of heaven will rejoice more over the one who was found than the 99 who were stayed back. And so we are going to rejoice. We're going to have a, a, an attitude about us. We're going to have, a, we're going to have a, a, a vision about our church that says there are people out there who you know, who are close to you, but they're far from God. And that we're going to be about them. And it says that there is rejoicing in heaven over the one who is found because he strayed away, but now he's found. And the word that jumps out to me is that in the kingdom, we rejoice. When someone is carried away from their mistakes, rather than being a culture that revels in someone being canceled for their mistakes. I think the church has fallen into this trap a little bit. We revel at someone being canceled. I'm glad they got caught. We revel, I mean, so many, you know, now we know everything, right? We, we think that things are happening more often. It's not that they're happening more often. We just know every time they're happening. Like every time they're happening. And so we now have access to everyone's lives. We have access to everyone's failures. We have access to every church and every problem that they're dealing with. And so we see pastors that are falling now. We know about them. Pastors have always been sinners, by the way. Always. If any pastor tells you that they're not, that you, that you just hadn't gotten to know them good enough. Because you wouldn't believe them. Because we're all sinners. We're just a sinner preaching about the only one who's not. That's all we are. And so we see these pastors falling. And, and I see the church reveling in it sometimes. Making fun of them. Calling for their heads. And I think it breaks Jesus' heart. Because I think he's the one who runs after the one who fallen. I've seen churches kick people out because they fell. Not associate with them. Why? Because they're just like the religious leaders who said, why are you associating with them, Jesus? And Jesus told us a story to tell the Pharisees why he would live that way. And he tells us this story because he wants to show them that, that there's this picture of us carrying away someone away, not from the church. Hey, we need to carry you away from here because you can't be close to us because you fell. But carrying them back to the church, carrying them away from the very thing that took them away. Carrying them away from their greatest weaknesses rather than canceling them away from relationship. That's hero stuff. Kind of in my mind is a first responder who's carrying away someone from the fire. You never see a first responder carrying someone towards the fire. They carry them away from the fire. That's hero stuff. And Jesus is showing us that it's hero stuff to get into someone's life right in the midst of their weakness and right in the midst of their shame and right in the midst of their sin. And to say, I want to carry you away from there. I don't want to cancel you because of your mistake. The next story Jesus tells is another parable. It's called the parable of the lost coin, and it teaches a similar way about the kingdom. But Jesus tells these three stories in, in succession, so I think we should preach these three stories in succession. They, don't, they, they, maybe, they maybe make more sense together because Jesus is painting an, an entire picture. And so Jesus tells of a woman who loses one of ten silver coins, 10% of everything she has. And she searches high and low for it. In fact, the scripture says that she searches carefully for it. She searches carefully. And I love this. When we see um, people who have fallen into sin or have made a mistake, we also should see on them. When we see someone's greatest mistake in living color and it's broadcast for everyone to see and you see their lives falling apart. And yes, we see their failures. I know we see that. But we also should see handle with care. What if we saw the people that are falling all around us? What if we saw the people that are in your lives that need Jesus so much? What if we saw those that are close to you but they're far from God? Not with an eye of judgment. It's not our position to judge. It's, it's way beyond our pay grade. It's Jesus and God's, that's, that's their role. 
What if we saw it's not my position to judge, but it's my position to handle with care? To carefully, the, the woman, it says, carefully went through looking for the lost coin. She, she carefully, with precision, she handled with care. We, we handle with, we handle with care. And I was, I was thinking about that. It's our job to care. It's God's job to convict. It's, it's not your job to convict someone of their sin. Do you, do you know that? Do you know that most people, no, not all, there are a few who don't realize it, and, and, and God will do the job in that, but do you know that most people know that their life is not very well put together? Do you know that most people know that there, there's something missing? Do you know that most people know when they've blown it that you don't have to come along and, and remind them that they've blown it? Have you found that to be true about yourself? Here's something, that, here's a good outlook in life. Most of the things that you find to be true about yourself are also true about others. Like, because you, you would say, man, that hurt my feelings, but yet we'll do the same thing to hurt other people's feelings. I didn't, I didn't feel invited, but then we don't invite people. I didn't feel included, but then we don't include people. Well, I felt judged, but then we judge people. Well, well I, I didn't feel handled with care, but then we don't handle people with care. And I wonder if it's, it's in, the, in the lowest part where all of us have seen that people will kick people when they're down. That it was Jesus showing us when he picked Peter up out of the water how we are to respond with grace. And he's showing us in this story with the woman that she handled with care. God handles the conviction. We don't have to handle it. And so, so we see in these stories that God is a God of repentance and rejoicing. And we've seen now in two stories in Luke chapter 15 that when God finds his people, how does he feel? Joyful, really joyful. And God is very happy when we repent. It is, it is, it, it's God that is happy. It says, look at this, it says this. And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. So she calls in all her friends. She's going to rejoice. Remember, the shepherd, the good shepherd, when he returned with the sheep, he rejoiced. We saw that. And then it says, in the same way, there is joy, listen to this, in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Now, some of you probably have heard this, and probably many of you have even said it because it's true, that when someone repents of sin and becomes a Christian, the angels rejoice in heaven. The, the angels rejoice, and they're having a party in heaven. How many of you have said that? Have you heard that said? It's true. The angels rejoice. But I want you to see something in this scripture because it's not quite accurate. There's a little bit more to the story than just the angels rejoice in heaven. What we just read is that there is rejoicing in the presence of of the angels when a sinner rep repents. What does that mean? Who is in the presence of the angels? God. Why is that important? Because look at the picture of God that this picture, that this paint, this truth paints. When we repent, it's God who throws a party. God is rejoicing, and then the angels are like, well, if he rejoices, we should rejoice. And so they're rejoicing. And can I tell you, if God is rejoicing and the angels are rejoicing, we should rejoice when a, repenter repent, when a sinner repents. And so God is modeling for us that he starts the party. God throws the party. God shouts in gladness. God is singing over us. God set the tone for what kind of church we should be when it comes to people coming home to him. God said, this is what you should do when someone falls. God is setting the tone. It's a Jesus way. People say, why is that your vision for your church? Because it's a Jesus way. Why do you go after those? Why do you go so much after those who've been out of church or not in church? Why do you care so much about seeing people? It's one of my favorite stories. It's seeing people who have not been to church in so long. We, we saw a first-time guest card last week. They said, we haven't been to church. Not in a long time. Not in months, not in weeks, not since COVID. No, we've never been to church. Can we just praise God that there are people showing up to our church that said, I see something in the Jesus way and I want to figure it out. I want to figure out who God is. I want to figure out how to get out of this sin in my life. I want to figure it out. God throws the party. That's why Christians, by the way, should throw the best parties. Don't throw lame parties. It, it speaks badly of all of us. Throw good parties. Have good food. I see my friend D out there. Be, be like D and make good food. Make food that people go, man, that'll make you want to slap your mama. That's so good. Don't, and you say, don't slap your mama. Just praise God because God made fajitas. God made D's special sauce. He made it. 
He, ma- he made all the spices that go into it. He made it. He put it together. So throw a good party. Have a party where people go, fun. Man, we had fun at church last week, didn't we? Because that was fun. We, ha- we like to have fun. We have- try to have fun every week. We try to have fun every single week. We try to make you laugh, try to make you cry, try to give you Jesus. That's my goal. And we have fun. And we want to show the world how to have fun. That there's a lot more fun to be had. So we throw good parties. And again, the response is that joy and celebration and rejoicing. I remember one time someone gave us a hard time, and uh, they said, they said, why, we shouldn't make so much noise after people get baptized. We should be reverent. And I was like, what are you talking about, man? What, what are you, we need to celebrate. We need to scream and holler. We need to celebrate because there's rejoicing that's going on when somebody gets baptized. Like, it's not a reverent moment. It's a rejoicing moment. It's a moment where we rejoice that there was someone who was dead who is now alive. And so that's the truth that Jesus shows us about the kind of church that we should be. And then there's the last parable that Jesus teaches. And he's teaching the same truth over and over. This is the parable of the lost son. And it says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. So Jesus thought, I need to illustrate this a little bit deeper. I need to illustrate this a little bit further. He says, I've shown a story about someone who maybe could have gotten preoccupied, could have been preoccupied with the 99, But they showed how they could not be preoccupied, and they went and found the one. And I want to make sure that my church never gets preoccupied, Jesus is saying. And I want to make sure as our pastor that we never get preoccupied. That we're not so worried about what's going on here that we forget about there. And and I want to tell you too, I I just want to say this. I think it's time to start inviting people again. I think it's time to not, to, to go, hey, they'll make their decision about where they are as far as, the, you know, pandemic and everything, but it's time to start inviting people again. It's time to go, I got three people that need church, because I was talking to, uh, the other day to a friend of mine who is a psychiatrist, and she said, people need church right now. They need to get together, they need to come and worship together, they need to gather, they need church. Can I tell you, people who are lost right now need Jesus, and they need the church to be his bride. So I want to encourage you, start inviting people. It's the kind of church we are. Start inviting people. Tell them, I want you to be here. And Jesus, he, he wants to illustrate further that we can get preoccupied with the 99. It's easy to because I love the 99. You guys are amazing. Like the, 99's my, the 99 makes up my best friends. The 99 makes up like the people that I do life with. The 99 are the people that show up to your house when you need them to. So I love the 99. But we don't want to get preoccupied with the 99. We want to under, understand that we're on mission with the 99. We are to go out with the good shepherd. Don't go out alone. We'll come with you. You don't have to go out and search for the one because we'll come with you. And so Jesus wants to celebrate or, or teach that even further. He also showed us a picture of someone who could have been careless. If the woman had been careless in the type of home that she lived in, it would have been easy to lose that coin. She could have brushed it into and under some dirt. She could have put it under a piece of wood that made up her house or a piece of clay or pottery that was in her house. But she carefully searched for it. And Jesus says, don't be careless. Be careful. And he wants to show our church, always be careful with those. Be careful with their emotions. Be careful with their pain. Be careful with the conviction that God has brought on them. It's not our job to kick them while they're down. And now he wants to show us a story of when we could be hurtful because we've been hurt. What have have we taught you all along? Is it hurting people hurt people? And we are all a room full of hurting people. No one joining us online right now isn't hurting. No one in this room is not hurting. We are a room full of hurting people. And so Jesus wants to show us when people have been hurt, they can hurt people. How do you not hurt people? And how do you receive that grace and give that grace? It says, so his father agreed to divide his wealth. Or sorry, I started the wrong place. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man who had two sons. To the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. He says, so I'm supposed to get the money when you die. I want my money now before you die. In essence, what the son was saying, I wish you were dead, dad, but you're not dead. So can I have what I would get once you're dead? That's hurtful. If your son said that to you, that's hurtful. And says, so his father, though, agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there, he wasted all of his money in wild living. And so he goes off into this distant place, and he gets away from God, 
He walks away from God. And that's where so many people find themselves when they need grace. Rarely does someone find themselves needing grace when they're not in a distant land. You're in a distant place where you've squandered everything. In a distant place where you've done the wrong thing. And it says, so he goes there and it's, it's all about wild living. And about the time his money ran out, by the way, your sin will always run out on you. Sin brings pleasure. Can I be the first pastor maybe to ever tell you that? Sin brings pleasure. There is pleasure in sin. But it has nothing compared to the, pa- to, the, to the purpose that God can give you and the pleasure that worshiping God can give you. But it brings pleasure. If any pastor ever tells you that oh, well, there's, there's no pleasure in sin, no, there's pleasure in sin. We wouldn't do it if it didn't bring pleasure. No one runs after pain. They run after pleasure. Then they realize that it ends in pain. But because the, the pleasure always runs out, and it always runs out into a very deep place of pain. And so this, this son realizes that. It says when the money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. And he began to starve. He persuaded the local farmer to hire him. The man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Now, Jesus didn't pick any farm animal. He wasn't like, you know, just, it could have been anything. It could have been any animal that he could have picked, but he picked pigs for a reason. This was showing the very lowest of the low. There was no lower that a Jewish man could get than to run off from his dad, number one, to take his money early, number two. To go and live with the Gentiles, number three, was already bad enough, but now to be feeding pigs. They weren't, Jewish people weren't allowed to be around pigs. They weren't allowed to eat pigs. They weren't allowed for anything, which by the way, I always say thank you, God, for Jesus, because we can eat bacon now. God, thank you. Thank you. Can every, somebody just give praise for bacon, just for a moment. I'll give praise. But this man, Jesus is showing, like he's at the lowest place he could be. He, he's feeding, asking to feed the pigs. And the young man became so hungry that even the pods that he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. He wasn't supposed to eat the pig, but he was eating what the pig ate. That's how low he was. And no one gave him anything. And when he finally came to his senses, we do always finally come to our senses if we follow after Jesus. And when Jesus is following after us and coming after us, we eventually come to our senses. That's what you need to pray for your ID3s, that they will come to their senses. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home... Even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here, I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of even being called your son. Please take me as a hired servant. And so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and he kissed him. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working, and when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of his servants what was, what was going on. And, your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf, and we are celebrating because of his safe return. And the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you. And never once refused to do a single thing you told to me, me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. We had to. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he was found. I want us to see a couple things in this parable that Jesus told us. A couple things that can teach us about ourselves. I want you to look at the attitude first of the older brother. The older brother, he he had an attitude, didn't he? Jesus, by the way, is talking to, remember, the religious people, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law who were disappointed at who he would hang out with and who he would be throwing a party for, who he was eating with. And I believe he cast them in this story as the older brother. He was showing them, just like he's showing you and I, as people who follow after him, that so quickly we can become the older brother. 
And here was the older brother's attitude. He says, all these years I have what? Slaved for you. I've slaved for you. I wonder if sometimes we feel like slaves to God when he has told us over and over again that we are sons and daughters. You see what the father said later? He said, yes, son, you have stayed with me always. He said, you weren't a slave. You stayed. And he said, you always had access to me. You always had access. He said, the son said, you've never even once thrown a party for me. You've never even once even had, you're giving him a, a fattened cow, cow, but you, you didn't even give a little young goat for me. You didn't do anything for me. And the, the father says, you've always had access to me. And I want us to see this as a church, as the people of God, because sometimes we can be like, man, why is this church so focused on those who are not here yet? Why, why is this church so focused on, on reaching those who are lost? Why are we always talking about reaching those who are hurting and in pain? And by the way, you are too. And so a lot of times the sermons are for you and you just don't even realize it because you're in hurting and you're in pain too. But what if you could see yourself in the position like, oh, I've always had access to him. What if the, the father representing God, what if God is showing us, Jesus is showing us that yet to the younger son, you still think it's about the stuff. You, you still think it's about the money that he took. You still think it's about the fact that he went off and sinned and that maybe I would be mad at him. You still think it's, when you don't realize that I'm the greater portion. Remember Jesus told Mary uh, and Martha, he, she said, Mary chose the greater portion. The greater portion was what? To be in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus. And what if for us as a church we could realize that part of what grace does for you and me as those who believe and follow after Jesus is we get the greater portion. I'm no longer having to run to God as one who is lost. I am one who's found. And so I get to be with you. He said, you've always had access to me. You stayed here the whole time. This was always yours. Everything that I have is yours. You never left me. And he's showing the church that we have Jesus. Well, what else do we need? We have Jesus. And we say, well, oh, this pain has come into my life. And, and this pain has, has really, it's come, I've lost someone. And, and so I can't deal with the pain. I found out we, we struggle with infertility and I can't deal with the pain. I found out my, I'm losing my job. I can't deal with the pain. Where is God? Where is God? And God is saying, my grace to you is sufficient. And my grace to you is I am enough. You've always got access to me. You may not have what you think you need, but you have exactly what you really need, which is me. And so that's grace for us who believe. And then we see in the Father so much, so much. Kenneth Bailey, the author of The Cross and the Prodigal, explains that if a Jewish son lost his inheritance among Gentiles and then he returned home, the community would perform a ceremony called the Kizaza. Say it with me, Kizaza. I taught you some stuff about the Jewish culture. You know almost as much as I know right now about Kizaza, saying the word at least. And the kazaza was, it was the cutting off ceremony. They would cut the son off. If the son left and went and lived with Gentiles, they had a whole ceremony, the kazaza. And in that ceremony, they were saying, you are cut off. You are canceled. And so Kenneth Bailey asked the question, he says, why did the father run? Because remember what the scripture says, it says the father ran. And by the way, in the Jewish culture, men of this age didn't run. Number one, it was awkward because they would have to hike up their robes. And so they would hike up their robes. But in doing that, they would show their bare legs. And it was very shameful in the Jewish culture to, to show their bare legs. Might be a good idea to bring back now anybody who's seen the man's legs. It ought to be shameful. It is. And so, so they would show their legs. It would shame the whole family, right? Show the whole, shame the whole family. So the father, to run, he would have to... He'd have to pick up the robe, and then he would have to run, which was shameful. And, but, but Kenneth Bailey says, why did he run? Did he just run because he saw his son from a distance, which I've preached before, and I love the fact that he, he must have been watching from a distance. He must have seen him coming. He must have heard about him coming because he saw him from a great distance, and he ran to him. Did he just run to him because he wanted to get to him? 
Did he just run to him because he wanted to hug him for the first? I think all of that's true. I think God wants to see you. He wants to be with you. He, he wants to, but no, I think he ran, and Kenneth Bailey says this, because of the kazaza. Here's the thing about the kazaza. Because the father had been shamed, he would not go to this ceremony. He didn't want to be in front of his son again. He'd been too shamed. And so the community, when they found out that the son was back in town or was somewhere near, they would go and get the son. And the community would bring the son in, and then they would take a clay pot and to symbolize the cutting off, they would take this pot, and in front of the son, just to show him everything, they would break it. And this would be a symbol of you are cut off. You're canceled. Don't ever show your face around here again. Don't ever be here again. Your father is not here because he doesn't want to ever see you again because you're no longer his son. Leave town. And then the community would run him out of town. That was the kazaza. And here's what I believe. The father needed to get to the son before the community did because they were going to cancel him. And so the father ran because he knew, oh, if I know he's here, somebody else knows he's here. And before they throw that pot down, and before they make him feel like he's broken, and before they show him the shattered pieces of his life, and before they show him that you're no longer alive, he said, I want to gather him in my arms, and I want to tell him, I would never throw you out of my family. I would never break you. I would never tell you that you're, you're canceled. And so Jesus is saying to the religious people, that's us, make sure you never throw the kazaza. But instead, I want you to throw the party. Get the, they threw, they had a ceremony. It was just a different ceremony. They threw a party. So he gets the fatted calf. He gets the music going. I always like to believe it was a redeemed Jay-Z. I just like, I don't know why. I just like to believe that. And so he gets it all going. And, and then they are, they are celebrating instead of canceling. Can I tell you, I know that you feel like this broken pot sometimes. That someone has thrown you down. They've broken you. You feel like you're not worthy of the grace of being gathered back together and put back together. But I want to let you know in this moment right now, God's not throwing a kazaza for you, and neither is he for the people who aren't here yet. God's throwing a party, a celebration. And he's celebrating the fact that you're still his son and daughter. You can be forgiven and redeemed. That's why when the son got there, the son said, I got a whole speech. I got a whole speech. I'm going to tell my dad. I, I just tell him I can be one of his slaves. And he start, gets there and he starts to talk. Because he's just, because the son knows about the kazaza, right? He's been raised up in a Jewish home. He knows. He's just, hey, maybe if I could just be your slave, just don't kick me out, dad. If I could, just don't, don't, don't break the pot, dad. If I could just be your slave, don't, just let me, just live in your household. That's all I want. I don't need anything else. I know I have no rights. I have no privileges. But he gives him a robe, which was a covering and a symbol of the fact that he was welcomed into his family. It was a, it was a signal of, of great love. He gives him the ring, which was the ability to purchase and to represent the family. It was a signet ring. He would be able to stamp and buy things at the market. It was like having a credit card. It was like, hey, I can spend. I can... He gave him rights and privileges of his son. He gave him his sandals and said, you will, you will walk in my family. You will walk. You will walk, not work. Slaves didn't get those sandals. You will walk, not work. He says, because you're, you're one of mine. And Jesus is telling you that right now. I want you to understand grace. And Paul said, what should we do? We should, should we have this grace? Should we keep on sinning? No, of course not, Paul said. No, we, our response is, wait a minute. If I'm back in the family, if I never was not a part of the family, if I was always welcome in the family, then I'm going to act like the family. Jesus says, there's a certain culture. Do you see how it goes full circle? There's a certain culture of the kingdom. 
And what he was saying to religious people is, you should be the younger brother who's been received back into the family, now acting like you would give grace to everybody else. You shouldn't be like the older brother who has now wants to cancel him. You, you should have lived this full circle. Because you've been given grace, you should give grace. Because you've been given forgiveness, you should give forgiveness. Because you were searched for, you should search for others. And Jesus, the master teacher, shows them exactly how the Jesus way works. And he shows us of a theology of grace. God, thank you for grace. As we respond to you, Jesus, we just thank you for grace. We thank you that you give us every opportunity to worship you, to be with you. We thank you that when we have fallen and when we have sinned, that God, you are there standing and waiting and running for us. You seek us when we are lost. You search carefully for us when we're lost. You're never preoccupied. You're always there when we need you, in a time of need, God. Your love, it never goes away. Nothing can take away the love of God. Not sin, not shame, not squandering everything you've given us, Lord, because your love is so much greater than anything that we can imagine. And so because of that, we live, God, the Jesus way. We give love to others as our final answer. We give grace to others as our response. And we give grace to ourselves because you've given it to us. How could we doubt what you've given us? Because you are good. Just give him thanks for being good right now in your own voice. Say, God, you are good. Thank you for being good. Thank you for allowing us to respond to you, to worship you, in Jesus' name, we give you that now, our worship. Amen.